Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joe Nagy, and welcome to Politics in the Pub and the discussion, Islamophobia in Australia, the politics of race hate in neoliberal Australia. We are privileged to have expert speakers on this subject. Associate Professor Alana Linton is from the Cultural and Social Analysis School of Humanities and Communication Arts at the University of Western Sydney. She works on the critical theorization of racism and multiculturalism. She is currently working on a new research program, Racism and Anti-Racism in a Digital Age. I just kind of wanted to set uh, in context some of what's been said uh, excellently by both Yasser and Jock in the context of some of the research that I've been doing. Um, and I want to argue that in order to understand the particularity and the extent of Islamophobia in, shall we call it, the West, it's necessary to understand what we mean by something called the post-racial. Now, many people claim that we live in a post-racial time, and there are variants to this argument. For those on the right, to say that we are post-race usually means that it is about time that racialized minorities stopped moaning about the injustices of the past. This is the kind of racism that we hear from the talkback radio show hosts who claim that Aboriginal people have been given too many handouts. It's the racism of Tony Abbott when he said that Sydney, and I quote, was nothing but bush before the arrival of the first fleet. The Tea Party in the US is also being post-racial when it claims that Obama, apparently a Kenyan Muslim in disguise, now wields a mighty hand over oppressed whites who are too scared to speak the truth. Now for those on the left, on the other hand, post-racialism takes a slightly different tack. It's usually claimed to celebrate the end of racism. For left liberals, Obama's election, for example, is proof that the civil rights movement was successful in putting pay to segregation and discrimination for once and for all. If we didn't know it already, the recent spate of police murders in the US which unleashed the Black Lives Matter movement has put pay to that idea, or so you would think. However, there are many people out there who aren't convinced. The Ferguson Grand Jury, for example, which decided not to indict the police officer who shot innocent black teenager Michael Brown. Sorry. Or just last week, the shooting dead of three young Muslim students in Chapel Hill in the US by their neighbor, which has largely been excused as a dispute over parking in the street, despite the well-known militantly atheist and Islamophobic views of the killer. Hi, crime. But although the arguments on the left and the right differ in character, they converge on the idea that in general, there's too much talk about race. And that talking about race distorts what are thought of as rational uh, conversations about the type of issues that we're dealing with here tonight. So we can't talk rationally because we're too invested in this thing called race. Now, as a scholar of race, I actually find this very interesting. We might ask, why is talking about race seen as irrational or distorted? when racialized minorities are accused of playing the race card, it's as though they invented the concept of race and forced it on everybody else. But in fact, as we know, it was the other way around, right? It was Europeans who invented race and used it as a system to justify colonizing, settling, and usurping the resources of two-thirds of the world. Yet, it is racialized minorities who play the race card. So that's quite interesting. Now what I want to do briefly is to show why, far from being some kind of sleight of hand, race is not only relevant to understanding Islamophobia, but that the denial of the significance of race is part of the way in which racism gets played out today. A key feature of what I'm calling here post-racialism is this denial of racism. Distancing oneself from racism is in fact now seen more important than talking about the racism itself. And you can observe this in a whole host of contexts. For example, those incidents of racism on buses and trains 
there's always some kind of comment piece in The Guardian or the Sydney Morning Herald that says, yes, you know, there were some ignorant bogans who will always be racist, but isn't it heartening to see how many bystanders stood up for those who were being attacked? Very often, on top of it, this is claimed to be some kind of part of the Australian way, something to do with mateship or sticking up for fairness. So being against racism is then made part of our national identity. So what then of colonial genocide or the white Australia policy? Were these all aberrations? The same logic is at work in asylum seeker policy. The left likes to use slogans such as not in our name or the new one is we're better than this. But the question is really are we? <laughs> Distinct, distancing, deflection, and denial of racism are what I call the three Ds of racism management. And what is particularly interesting about the way that this works is that it is across the board from left to right. So it's not a right-wing phenomenon alone. Take, for example, something that's already been mentioned briefly by Jock, the Sydney-based Party for Freedom, who said on its website uh, about the plan to uh, build a Muslim community centre. What do they say on their website? The part, now, just to explain who the Party for Freedom is, it's, it's a tiny group, you've been excused of never having heard of them. They're kind of a splinter group of a splinter group on the fascist fringe in, in Australia. But there are no swastikas or other fascist iconography or the kind of incendiary language that one would associate with fascist groups traditionally on their website. Instead, the PFF, claims to oppose the community centre because mosques, as it wrongly calls it, are, as we all know, well known to harbour and encourage Islamist extremists. Now, when Muslim groups or anti-racists point out that allowing the beliefs of a small group to stand for an entire religious group amounts to racism, as Jock pointed out, the retort is immediately, it's impossible to be racist towards a religion. Why? Because Islam's not a race. It stands to reason. So the first appeal of Islamophobes is notionally an anti-racist appeal. And this is, I think, very important to understand. But what type of anti-racism is it? Many scholars, starting with Martin Barker in his 1981 book, The New Racism, have pointed out uh, that what they called a new cultural racism had come to replace so-called old biological understandings of race. Now the argument went that the right had, if you like, adopted an anti-racist language of cultural relativism to argue that yes, we all agree today, race is a bogus concept, there are no such thing as, as biological races, there is only one human race. But, they argued, there are different and the argument went incompatible culture. So race is bogus, but culture is real. And unlike the multicultural left, the right argued, each cultural group has its own natural home. And that immigration and cultural mixing was bad, not only for white so-called hosts, but also for minorities whose culture risked being diluted through migration. Now, while well, certainly I agree that there was a shift in far-right discourse in the 80s and 90s from open to covert racism, if you will, my argument is that this idea that culture has replaced biology is not, in fact, new. In fact, both biological and cultural arguments have always been intertwined in racial theory or racist ideas. Racialization involves taking cultural traits and making them natural or immutable. The purpose of race is to ensure the purity of reproduction and succession, and this is why race emerges under very specific conditions, those of imperialism and colonialism. It is inherently bound up with property, ensuring some have the right to it and others do not. Who has the right to a stake in the future, and who is an imposter who will be tolerated only until they claim their just stake, their just share in that stake. So Islamophobia, just like anti-Semitism and other cultural racism, if you like, is racism. Racism imposes double standards, using isolated incidents to make generalizations, again, something that Jock said, about whole groups, 
and deny them justice and excuse violence against them on that basis. Now, post-racial racism not only denies its racism on cultural grounds, but that denial of racism is one of the main vehicles through which racism actually functions today, which adds another level to our pre-existing understanding of racism. Racism is an ever-changing phenomenon that you know, we need to get ahead of to understand. What this results in is that not only do those who face racism have to endure violence, discrimination, and vilification, you know, this is nothing new, we all know about this stuff, but a second post-racial level of justification adds insult to injury. Now, in the book I wrote with Gavin Tipley, The Crisis of Multiculturalism, we argued that the post-9-11 consensus that multiculturalism was, to quote German Chancellor Angela Merkel, an utter failure, led to the dismantling of many of the structures put in place to deal, albeit problematically, with racism in places like Western Europe, here in Australia, Canada, and so on. The move away from multiculturalism towards a mainstreaming of diversity is one way in which this was done. Now, diversity politics, if you like, is a kind of a one-stop shop for tackling discrimination that puts gender, disability, ethnicity, sexuality, and so on in one basket. Now, of course, it's vital to recognize how discriminations intersect and exacerbate each other. But what the diversity approach encourages is a flattening out of difference so that the roots of particular forms of injustice and exclusion become obscured. If we no longer have any historical narrative behind racism, or indeed sexism or homophobia, we cannot explain what it is and where it comes from. It leads to racism being seen as largely an individual attitude that is universal. The argument is that it is natural for all people to be racist. Now this is simply historically inaccurate. There is nothing either natural or universal about the idea of race. Further, by lumping racism in with other forms of discrimination, we see sexism and homophobia, for example, being made compete with racism. This is how, to return to the party of freedom, in its opposition to the, Me to the Penrith Muslim Cultural Center, can claim that Muslims are anti-women, anti-gay, and have hatred for Jews, Sikhs, and non-believers. Here we have a fascist party ostensibly taking a pro-feminist, pro-gay rights stance in the name of opposition to Muslims who, from this point of view, are portrayed as the real fascists. But crucially, you couldn't put a cigarette paper between the PFF and the Attorney General, or indeed, many reputable newspaper columnists. So this is no longer a fringe belief, if it ever was. So post-racialism, I'm arguing, creates an amazing consensus whereby mainly those with white privilege, from the leaders and opinion makers of most Western states down to their fascist fringe groups, agree that an entire religious group made up of diverse and heterogeneous populations should be brought to book because they are the chief deniers of the rights of women, sexual and other racialized minorities. Now, this is in a country, and I'm just talking about Australia here, but this happens in all over the place, where more, more than one woman is murdered by her current or former partner every week. Now, there are many solutions proposed to this so-called threat, from the more to the less violent, but there is one thing that all, shall we call them Islamophobes, agree on, that we must be, as the German sociologist Christian Jocke put it, intolerant to be tolerant. Now, let's take a second to consider what this means. The post-racial, post-multiculturalist argument is that Muslims have been allowed to run roughshod over the rights and freedoms of the rest of us. That we have been so cowed by our own guilt for colonialism, or some such, that we have bent over backwards to be tolerant of those who only seek to silence us. The main way in which we, you know, the silent, tolerant majority, have been denied our rights is through the denial of our freedom to call a spade a spade. We are not allowed to speak out about Muslims because someone is always there to call us a racist. And because we know that the worst thing that could happen to you in life is to be called a racist, remember the three Ds of racism management, then that, that is, this, it, 
who's deny a lot of our right is doing us, the fair-minded majority, a gross injustice. And so it's time that this brave, silent majority took the bull by the horns, threw caution to the wind, see I'm running with a certain theme, and called it like it is. In the name of freedom of speech, it is time Muslims were denied the freedoms we have given them for too long. Now wait a minute, did I just say that? <laughs> Hang on a second, right? It's time we denied people freedom in the name of freedom. <laughs> In arguing for the ban on the hijab and the burqa in France, this is exactly what Christian Jonker argues, to take just one example. And this is exactly what is being argued by the free speech warriors who arrested those who refused to be Shali in the aftermath of the Charlie Hebdo murders. It is exactly what is being claimed by those who say that the Chapel Hill shootings of three Muslim students had nothing to do with race, but was a mundane disagreement over parking. What is essentially being said is that only some of us get to define our experiences. Only some of us get to be angry. I can be angry that you were offended by my cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad and draw some more and encourage others to republish them, but you don't have the right to be angry and burn them. Your protest is invalid. Freedom of speech is a universal right, but all types of speech are not free. So we must repeal the Racial Discrimination Act because it denies the right to be a bigot. But we need tougher laws to curtail your bigotry. Post-racial racism elevates my sense of injury over yours. In that sense, there is nothing post about it. Let's just call it racist. White bigotry is seen as benign, without intent, mere words that, unlike sticks and stones, can never hurt. And when it does incite and hurt, it was a dispute over parking. <laughs> the victim might have been planning a suicide bombing, or as was argued after the Otoya tragedy in Norway, this was, after all, you know, the logical outcome of what the British journalist David Goodhart called too much diversity. <laughs> Muslim words, black words, Aboriginal words, cause us pain. We who have given so much, our anger is justified when you throw our hospitality back in our face, when you reject our values or refuse to stay in your place, a place you should be grateful to have been given. This is the logic of post-racial racism and Islamophobia, and this is why it works so well. By avoiding tainted arguments about inferiority and genetics, and focusing on the old themes of what David Goldberg calls progressivist racism or assimilationist racism, Gratitude, hospitality, integration, civilization, post-racialism hides the trace of race that is within it. But, and I'll just end with this, it is instructive that such appeals are often followed with a proviso. I'm not being racist, but the denial of racism is the admittance of racism. And this opens a crack at which we can begin to chip away. Excellent.